I think you've figured out by now that cancer can touch anybody in this room. Um, it, it does, it's not selective. Um, it doesn't just go for those who might tan too much or smoke too much. It can hit anybody. Um, oncology nurses often sit around. We have unique conversations, as you well can imagine. But one thing that we all agree on is why does cancer always hit the really, really, really nice people? And, and that's what happens. And, and the highlight of our program tonight is to have you hear a story from one of the nicest people we know um, who has a wonderful family. And I think it's important to know that she's a wife, she's a mother, she's a great person, she's a friend, and intermingled along there, oh yeah, maybe she had cancer because it is not the priority of her life. She's moving on. She has other things to do. So please help me in welcoming Becky Stark. Thank you, Karma, for that very thoughtful introduction. I'm unbelievably flattered to be here standing before you tonight. And my goal is to have one thing come out of my mouth that walks through those doors that you can share with someone because you never know who needs to hear one of the random facts that I may share with you tonight. I'll give you a little bit about myself. I'm married to my best friend from high school, David Stark, and I'm a busy mom. He's right back there. I'm a busy mom of four amazing children, and in my opinion, are some of the most understanding, compassionate, and faith-filled children. Kara is 12. You can give a wave. <laughs> Ainsley is 10. Kale is 8. And Marin is 6. In addition to being a wife and a mother, I volunteer, I coach, and I practice my faith. I'm just like many of you in this room. When word started to migrate that I had cancer, a friend from college reached out and shared the following with me. You are a survivor from the day you were diagnosed. And I'm proud to say that as of today, I'm a 15-month breast cancer survivor. Thank you. People were shocked when they learned that I had breast cancer. There was a beautiful movement that brought so much kindness, love, and amazing amount of open faith to my doorstep. Was it because I was young? Was it because I lived in the suburbs? Was it a wake-up call to so many people who thought, it could never happen to me, but it happened to me? This disease doesn't just affect me. It affects my husband, my children, my family and my friends, my children's children, my children's friends, my husband's work community, the list goes on. Cancer doesn't discriminate. It affects everyone in some way. If I had a nickel for every person that asked, how did you find your cancer? I'd have a lot of nickels. <laughs> I'd like to take you back through a few months at how my story began. Tuesday, May 11th, 2010. I began packing for a weekend getaway. As I reached a suitcase that was perched high on my closet shelf, it slid down and it hit me in the upper left chest. After I caught my breath, I quickly placed my hand to where the suitcase hit me in the chest and I began to rub it to kind of wear the sting away. I immediately grazed upon an odd, painful lump. I assumed it was from the suitcase and continued to prep for a much needed getaway. Did I share I have four children? <laughs> I needed the break. <laughs> About a week and a half after we returned from our trip, my chest was still pretty tender to the touch. I wasn't overly concerned, and frankly, I just thought it was a bruise. But for some reason, I decided I needed to make an appointment to be seen. After an exam, which led to an ultrasound, and then a mammogram, and ultimately biopsies, this bruise started to take on a new life. Tuesday, June 8th. I almost missed a call that morning due to heavy Nerf gun fire, but I managed to grab my phone on the last ring. Seeing the caller ID and knowing it might not be great news, cancer still never really entered my mind. After all, I was only 37, 
no history of breast cancer, and was just basically too naive to entertain the thought. The doctor, in a very gentle tone, delivered the following. Becky, your results came back, and the report indicates that your biopsy is consistent, yeah, get ready for this, is consistent with that of poorly differentiated invasive ductal carcinoma. <laughs> That's how you people talk to normal people. What is that? <laughs> Again, while dodging flying Nerf bullets, I grabbed a piece of paper and a pen and asked her to re repeat what the report read. I scribbled down some phonetic attempts and planned to Google them after I hung up the phone, but the word carcinoma lingered on my tongue for a second. It wasn't until the doctor said, I wish I had better news for you, Becky. I'm really sorry. That's when it hit me. I have cancer. It was Principal Charity Class Week, and David was swamped with work and his responsibilities at Blank Children's Hospital. He was shaking hands and having all the media moments, but I needed him. I was struggling to breathe while hiding on my front porch where my kids couldn't see me or hear me. We have a cellular code at our house. One call equals, call me back. Two calls equals, it's pretty important, could you call me back sooner than later? And three calls means, pick up your damn phone now. <laughs> We've only used that one other time since then. <laughs> David managed to find an unoccupied pine tree to hide behind to avoid the stern person holding the, the quiet please sign on the golf course. And after a few chaotic moments, we both dried our tears, said our I love yous, and promised that we'd do our best to slay this dragon, whatever that meant. As odd as it may sound, I really didn't know a single person that had ever had breast cancer. I was one of the lucky ones. What was next? The medical blizzard continued with MRIs, scans, consults, and other various appointments. My surgeon recommended that I proceed with what's called breast conservation therapy, which means the removal of the tumor and the perimeter of the compromised tissue. I had no reason to disagree with that treatment plan. I just wanted the stuff out of my body. After hours of discussion and tears, David and I called a family meeting. The kids needed to be the first to know. We explained to my children the reason for so many doctor's appointments and that mommy had cancer and needed surgery to remove it. I assured each of them that cancer wasn't a disease that you can catch from anyone, while David stressed to them that cancer hates love. And their job was to blast me with heavy, heavy doses of it. With a stiff upper lip, Kale, my then seven-year-old, fought back the tears and said, I don't want to be the only second grader without a mom. And he melted into my lap. It broke my heart to see them so sad and so angry and so confused. But that's when I saw these small blossoms change into enormous blooms of love and faith. Thursday, June 15th, I was scheduled for surgery that morning and I needed one additional MRI to pinpoint the cancer's exact location. While laying on that cold, hard table, all I could think about was how my family was reacting that morning and how strong they were when they hugged me when I left. Something clicked. I decided to take control back. I decided I never wanted breast cancer in my body again. And I decided that for me, a bilateral mastectomy was my best option. Each of us is our own best advocate, and I believe that that decision saved my life. Later that morning, my MRI indicated two cancerous spots on my other breast, as well as another suspicious spot, none of which I even knew were there. Later, I asked why my tumor hurt and why my tumor was painful, and my doctor's response, because you were lucky. During surgery, it became evident that the cancer had spread into a few lymph nodes, which, mean, which meant chemotherapy was in my future. Yeah, lucky. I began blogging on care pages those first days that I was recovering in the hospital. It was a therapeutic way for me to process everything that was happening so quickly and to document my own cancer journey. It was also an avenue to let the many people who cared so much about our family how I and how we were all doing and I could tell them all at once. Some days I found myself stalking my own page <laughs> to see who had left messages. <laughs> And I never once was disappointed. I 
was so thankful that I made the choice to post on Care Pages. Some days of that journey were a little easier being able to read a post from a close high school friend or a friend from college or someone that happened upon my situation and just wanted to touch base or reach out. I especially loved the words of encouragement from my incredible sister Barb, who's now slaying a dragon of her own. But one particular post comes to mind, and although she hacked into my care page, <laughs> I was so proud when Kira, my oldest, posted the following message to me. I love you, Mom, and I'm so proud of you because you beat cancer. Cancer hates love, and we gave it a giant dose of it. You're my role model, and I know that God is with you throughout your fight with cancer. Know that many people are praying for you, and now cancer hates you, Mom. A prayer had been answered that moment that I read Kira's note. I knew God was with us through this mess, but now my kids knew. God put so many angels along my stony path. Carrie Sievert at the lymphedema clinic helped me for weeks to regain strength and range of motion with physical therapy, which is an important part of my recovery. Also, a gift in my life was an angel named Jen Witt. Jen's a care coordinator through Stoddard, which is an amazing program. Somehow, Jen always knew where to find me before or after an appointment and was so kind and so inspiring. Jen would call when I needed to hear from her the most, and I knew that I could ask any question, whether it was my, with my recovery, side effects, medicine, or if I just needed to touch base with someone who knew what I was going through. We joked in our house that Jen was like my visa. She was everywhere I needed her to be. <laughs> Tuesday, July 19th. I started my first of eight rounds of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is awful, but the staff on that floor is nothing short of awesome. They take the time to make you comfortable, they show you that they care, and the love that they administer gave me hope and comfort and peace. They know that you're a sick patient, but when you walk through those doors, you're a person first. Oddly, I kind of missed them when I was done with chemotherapy. <laughs> but not enough to go back as a patient, at least. Tuesday, July 27th. I think it's safe to say that two characteristics, among many others, of course, that can be used to define women are breasts and hair. I was in trouble because not only was I concave from my double mastectomy, uh, all too soon I knew I was going to be bald. Definite Telly Savalas look alike. I'm tall, I'm wide, and pretty soon I was going to be bald. My girls helped me look out for my best interest, and they helped me pick out a great, very convincing do through a wonderful service called Look Good, Feel Better. Judy Sheehan made a very overwhelming and discouraging time in my life with such an understanding ear. She made it so much easier. She could see the anxiety not only in myself, but in my girls' body language and included them in the process of listening to the stress behind losing my hair. I have a blog that I'd like to share with you from a day that was especially tough for me that I posted on CarePage. I had a dream. I was standing in my bedroom at the lake, looking out in the cove on the water, witnessing the most horrific storm. Someone was in my bed resting, but I wasn't sure who it was. Strong winds snapped mighty oaks, blowing them like expired dandelions. Beautifully manicured shorelines and banks of heavy boulders of riprap crumbled and slid beneath the surface. Boats toppled, crashing into each other like a toddler playing with matchbox cars. I could see power outages in all of the surrounding homes, but the light was on in my room. The rain was driving down so hard, yet I could see each element of ruin exactly as it was happening. Three times during the dream, I recalled thinking I should take cover in the basement because at any moment, my house could be next to cave. But there wasn't a force leading me to a lower level to wait out the storm. I just kept witnessing the ugliness. I just felt content to wait it out and watch through the window. Then I woke up. Odd dream, yes, but not that crazy considering the recent weather and the images that were peppered all over the local media from the Delhi disaster. On the way to Mass that Sunday, as we neared the church, a beautiful white morning dove sat in the street squarely in front of the car, and it flew off to my side as we neared it. It struck me as so incredible. 
We walked into church seconds after the priest proceeded down the aisle, and we slipped into our signature front row. We're always late. <laughs> As I glanced up, I caught sight of an altar server that had recently received his back-to-school buzz cut, and he was bald. It shook me, and the tears welled in my eyes. Not because the boy was bald, but because soon I was going to be. Later in the day, David took the kids out on the water for a couple of hours. I used the time to enjoy the beautiful day, and while relaxing outside in the quiet, I just could not shake the thought about that dream. And it was then that I started to put the pieces together. The dream of the storm, my interpretation, was that I was the one in the bed, and God was protecting me from the storm, keeping his light shining bright. The dove, I can find peace in knowing that God is with me, and hope that I never forget that, even on the toughest of days. And now the bald server. I started losing my hair that Sunday afternoon. Thank God my eyes were open, and I saw the signs that he's near me because this part is harder than I imagined. But I have faith, and he will help me through this storm. Two days later, I was bald. With the help of my children's hand and someone we trust, my niece, Valerie Wellendorf, I once again reached a goal of shaking down cancer's power over me. Together, they all shaved my head, and while I made this choice, it wasn't until that day that I felt really sick. As days turned into weeks and weeks into months, my wig became my security blanket. I never left the house without it, not only because I needed it, but because my children needed it too. I didn't answer the door without it. I'd sprint to the pantry to avoid shocking neighbor kids coming in and out. 98% of the time, I wore that wig from the sweltering month of July through most of the spring soccer season. Yes, I stressed out a number of times in dressing rooms when you're trying on clothes and it flew off. Yes, stressed out some mornings when the paper would read that it was going to be windy or rainy. But I tried to make the best of it, not just for myself, but for my kids. My children, these strong, courageous loves of my life, deserved it, to say the least. Little did I know how much, but enough was enough, and enough time passed. One Sunday afternoon in early May, I was sitting on the sidelines of a soccer game daydreaming. Mm, sorry. The winds had picked up considerably, and I found myself mentally rehearsing a cover story <laughs> that I had concocted in the event that my wig caught wind and flew off. <laughs> I would dash onto the field as I was whistling for my dog. I'd s <laughs> I don't have a dog. <laughs> I'd scoop it up, I'd pet it, and I'd bolt to the car. <laughs> a ridiculous but very true story. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Tuesday, May 17th. I found the courage to take my wig off for the first time and show the world how far I had come since the day I found that lump a year earlier. I'm not sure if you've noticed, but most of the significant and traumatic days of my cancer journey occurred primarily on Tuesdays. I decided very early on that cancer didn't deserve another day of the week. And even though I would love to see Amy Bell more often, sorry, because we all know that behind every good doctor is a great nurse. I chose to keep all of my oncology appointments with Dr. Hedinger on Tuesdays, my chemotherapy infusions, Tuesdays, scans and any other appointment that came up, all on Tuesdays. It was a constant that my family relied on all through the summer and into the fall. The day had finally arrived that it was the first good Tuesday in five months. David and I made plans earlier in the week to surprise the kids and go do something fun. God knew we all needed it. I'd rounded the corner, and I was feeling a little better each day. My kids were exhausted of the ups and downs, and David was ready to have another full-time parent in the house. For nearly five months, David had been an amazing single parent every other week while I was out of commission from the awful side effects that chemotherapy had on me. Aside from working full-time, he was also managing his mom's medical care as she had been diagnosed with multiple myeloma two weeks after I learned I had cancer. Burning the candle at both ends seemed to be taking a toll on him, so he made an appointment 
just for my peace of mind. Tuesday, November 10th, a care page post. Tuesdays have become a tough day of, week, of the week at the Starks, and today was no different. On the day my family was going to celebrate the first Good Tuesday in five months, David was diagnosed with colon cancer. Now, I'm not much of a why asker, so I landed on what the hell. <laughs> Someone posted a very supportive message on my care page. Don't tell God how big your storm is. Tell your storm how big your God is. I was pretty sure I'd already done that once. My children crumbled from the shocking blow of more bad news. Between screams and with an outstretched finger, Ainsley tilted her head in confusion with tears streaming down her cheek and bellowed, you said cancer wasn't catchy. For another six months, I walked through those doors of the infusion room at Stoddard with David as he completed his 12 rounds of chemotherapy. My kids were amazing support for him with prayers, homemade cards, and anything else that they remembered that put a smile on my face when I was going through chemo. They dug down deep and drenched their dad with love, just as he had told them, even though it hurt them so badly to watch this ugly beast called cancer move back into our house. With months filled with countless hours of discussion, hugs, reassurance, more hugs, and an unbelievable amount of love, together as a family, we are finally over the hump and have begun the next phase of Better Tomorrows. And my Better Tomorrow started with reconstructive surgery. May 24th, 2011. We were finally able to celebrate that long-awaited first Good Tuesday. I secretly made arrangements with the teachers at my children's school, and they were going to be late that morning. Marin, lover of all things breakfast, begs many Sundays after church for breakfast at IHOP, which just happens to be across the street from St. Pius X School. So that morning, David kissed all of us before he left home and hit the road, but not for the office. Purposely running a few minutes behind, I took my time loading up the kids and all of their gear for the day into the car. We made our way to school, and instead of pulling into the parking lot for morning drop-off, I cruised right on by, which sent my kids freaking out. <laughs> I turned into the lot of IHOP and told them that I needed to pick something up for who knows what reason. I was pretty quick on the spot. We walked into the restaurant, and there, much to their surprise, sat David, and it was then that we celebrated our first Good Tuesday in over a year. What an awesome day. <laughs> Prayers, calls, texts, emails, posts, visits. I'm so lucky to have my family who pitched in to make my life easier. There is no greater love. I'm lucky to be blessed with friends who drove us and sat with us during chemotherapy and the numerous people who fed my family and carted my kids everywhere because we couldn't. And I'm lucky to be able to receive the care from the people of the medical team at John Stoddard, which has been and continues to be remarkable. I'd like to end tonight with a poem that I wrote a while back, which hopefully reiterates what cancer cannot take from you, your love of self, your love for others, and the love of our God. It's called Where is the Rainbow? Where is the rainbow? For I sat in the rain. I've searched high and low. Please tell me again. That storm that came through uprooting the sheep left me, lading, left me wading in waters, both shallow and deep. An image I caught glimpse. I'm tricked what I see. This reflection is foreign. Is that really me? I stand to walk forward. Unsteady, throbbing, I wait. Sensations of glass splinters is my walking fate. I grasp for support, but reach too high. With 90 degree limits, no more reaching for sky. Where is the rainbow? For I sat in the rain. It hardly seems fair, the trouble, the pain. I'm searching for gold, myself before June. I may never find her, looking from land to the moon. I do see an image in a puddle my face, the one in eight women with a troubling case. Still a proud friend, sister, mother, wife graced with his gifts of this cancer-blessed life. I don't search for her now, the gold at the ends. That gold is gone, replaced with the love of family and friends. These people I love, many fires they tame, aiding this fighter, survivor, and in this, no shame. So where is the rainbow? For I sat in the rain. It was there the whole time. He never let it wane.
Thank you. God bless.